and gentlemen. My name is Cynthia Rawich, and I am the interim dean of the Mike Kerr College of Arts, Media, and Communication. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening uh, to this third and final for the year presentation of our Commerce of Creativity speaker series. Um, I know many of you are familiar with these lectures from having attended before, and I thank you for your continued support for this program. Um, if this evening's lecture is your first in our Commerce and Creativity series, our speaker will provide a great introduction, I believe, to one of our college's goals, uh, to celebrate the women and men who exemplify the connection between the, uh, the art of creative communication and the art of business, Commerce of Creativity. We strive to provide for our students an educational environment and programs that will help them become like our speakers are, leaders who make creative contributions in a commercial world. I'm glad to see that there are so many students here this evening, and I believe more will be coming in. Uh, I applaud you for taking advantage of these opportunities to hear from the most esteemed members of the communities you will be going into uh, when, you, when you leave our university, your future professional communities, and to be inspired, as you will be tonight, uh, by a CSUN alumna. Before we begin our program, I want you to introduce one of our earlier distinguished speakers, uh, brand architect and CSUN alum, Tom White. Where are you, Tom? Oh, way back there, wave, all right. Uh, Tom was uh, one of our speakers uh, two years ago, I believe, and he also designed our Commerce of Creativity C2 brand and logo. Thank you very much. Uh, a special welcome, too, to the many faculty, staff, administrators, and alumni who represent the university, as well as CSUN's other fine colleges, business, humanities, social sciences, sciences, technology, um, and more. Your interest and support inspire us to expand this program and to bring more and different speakers with each passing year. To tell you about tonight's speaker, uh, I will introduce CSUN art professor Mario Antiveros. Mario is going to introduce Judy. Uh, Mario is an art critic, a curator, and assistant professor of modern and contemporary art history. His research examines <coughs> issues of solidarity, empowerment, social belonging, belonging and political obligation. Um, and his writings focus on critical art practices since the late 60s, art, produced alongside, within, and as part of the feminist, black power, Chicano Chicano, and international student movements, as well as the emergence of the HIV AIDS activism and cultural activism in the United States. Mario recently curated an exhibition in our own CSUN art gallery and created the catalog for it. This is not a self-portrait, reflections of erasure, belonging, and solidarity focused on eight Los Angeles artists uh, who reconfigure the genre of self-portraiture. Most importantly for tonight's purposes, Mario has worked with and for Ms. Baca. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mario Antiveros. Mario. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Before I begin tonight, um, before I begin introducing our distinguished speaker, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge the uh, 45th anniversary of Chicano Chicano Studies at CSUN. And uh, congratulations a lot. <laughs> it's an honor to introduce uh, Judy Baca. Uh, I owe her quite a bit. Here are a few words to describe her. Artist and organizer, educator and scholar, interventionist and community builder, activist and mentor. Doing well at any one of these things clearly is worthy of praise. Yet even collectively, these do not adequately describe Judy, Judy Baca's extraordinary accomplishments. Baca is and excels at all of these, of course. Yet, she has also radicalized and reimagined the limits of each category. 
Since graduating from CSUN with her Bachelor in Arts in 1969 and then receiving her Master's in Art Education at CSUN in 1980, Baca has charted new philosophies of art and developed new ways of linking theory and practice, form and content, activism, and aesthetics. She has organized centers of radical pedagogy and forged keen skills to navigate local and national civic agencies. She has served on the front lines of activism and created ways for imagining solidarity. You can tell where I received my inspiration from. Since 1996, she has been teaching at UCLA, the, Center, the Cesar e. Chavez uh, Department of Chicano Chicano Studies, and also in 1996, um, she began the UCLA at Spark Cesar Chavez Digital Mural Lab, which has reconceptualized the processes of mural, mural making with digital technology. She exhibits a tireless commitment to empowering, supporting, encouraging, and nurturing those near and far, individuals and groups, and communities and cities. As an artist, she is exceptional. Baca's work asks us to think about art's capacity to affect change. Baca's work encourages us to consider an important question, what can art do? Now to ask this question is to recognize that cultural production is a social practice. That is, making art is not simply a product to serve desire capitalism. Rather, it can transform the material realities of everyday life. Perhaps no other muralist, painter, scholar, activist has encouraged us to understand art's entanglement in the social realm more than Judy Baca. And importantly, and most radically, this understanding of what art can do is not limited to the viewers of her artwork. That's typically where it stays. But with Baca's work, it's also an underlying issue of those collaborators working with her to imagine, develop, and produce many large-scale local and international projects. So grappling with, the poten with art's potential to affect change has been central to over her over 40 years of art making. In fact, it began right here at CSUN as she was graduating from our program. With her grandmother, while her grandmother was looking at, her, at the recent graduate's artwork, she asked the young artist, what is it for? And Baca says, that question, that question really guided me from that point on. I knew my art had to have meaning or purpose beyond my self-gratification, and that it could speak to people I cared most about, my family and my community, end quote. Baca's overall project revolves around caring for and responding to another. One of her earliest murals was painted in 1970. At the time, the 24-year-old Baca was worked, at, worked as a youth counselor at the Parks and Recreation Department in LA. A collaborative project involving young adults, mostly gang members and often rival gang members, Baca made clear that the mural was a site, that the mural site itself was neutral territory. I mean, what can art do? Here, art creates a safe space, a neutral space, a space to put aside, if but only momentarily, but perhaps permanently, hostilities and conflict. Importantly, Baca's approach to public art production developed alongside and was in dialogue with the Chicano political movement, as well as the emerging Chicano art movement and the feminist movement. Each of these movements, and if you took my class, you know this, stressed the need for cultural production to educate to empower, and what often people forget, to heal. In 1973, one of Baca's earliest installations and performance works, which is now housed in the Smithsonian Museum of Contemporary Art's permanent collection, addressed issues of empowerment and Chicana subjectivity. And as she points out, it was probably in the first exhibition dedicated, or first art exhibition in Los Angeles uh, focusing on Chicana artists. In 1974, Baca orchestrated Los Angeles' Los Angeles's first citywide mural program, which was responsible for the productions of murals throughout the city. And here's what's significant. That program went to an entire institution. By 1976, that program had developed into the Social and Public Art Resource Center, which has produced hundreds of murals in Los Angeles, and importantly, has supported thousands of artists and crew members. She continues to serve as Spark's artistic director. 
Many here tonight are familiar with Baca's The Great Wall of Los Angeles. It started in 1976 and located in our own San Fernando Valley. The mural making process was a manifestation of community empowerment. It employed an economically and socially diverse group of 400 young adults. It included community-based workshops and hundreds of community members. Scholars contributed. Personal experiences and histories were recounted and collected, and the subject matter unfolded across 2,740 feet, which is, by the way, a lot longer than that. So, <laughs> The mural charts a multicultural history of Los Angeles. But what people tend to not know that's just as significant is the mural's ability to engage, quote, the history of inner racial struggle between adolescent youths who frequented that site, as Baca has written. I'd like to mention one final and portable project. That's Baca's The World Wall, A Vision of the World Without Fear, which she developed collaboratively, collaboratively with a group of 45 international students. And the theme is probably best illustrated by an overarching question that was raised in one of the mural production workshops, and that was, if we cannot imagine peace as an active concept, how can we ever hope for it to happen, end quote. The theme is as significant today as it was when the work was installed first in, in Finland in 1990. Since that installment, this multi-panel, 240-foot portable mural has exhibited internationally in the United States as well as in Mexico. Let me conclude by emphasizing Baca's commitment to theorizing and producing a rigorous, socially committed, and collaborative-based public art practice. Baca reminds us, quote, space is power. Take over a big public space and you've got power, end quote. Indeed, her work creates spaces for, and even serves as a resource for, imagining what is needed to affect change. It, is, it serves what is desired and what is needed to bring about personal and political and cultural and economic transformation. And especially, her work raises the question, what can art do? And it is with a great honor, and I ask you to please give an incredibly warm and heartfelt welcome, CSUN welcome, to our distinguished speaker. <laughs> Because the last I saw him, he was a beginning scholar and beginning to know too much about me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Maria, for, for that great introduction. In fact, it's an honor to be here tonight, and I, I want to say thank you for bringing me and to all my friends in the audience. Um, it's kind of overwhelming to come back to a place in which you took your, force, your first steps toward becoming an artist at a time even when I didn't know what that meant. Um, there were people who had great influence on me here. And certainly, um, walking these streets uh, remind me of that particular time. I'd like to thank the Mike Curb College of Arts and Communication, and certainly the Commerce of Creativity Distinguished Speaker Secret CEP Series for giving me the opportunity to speak here tonight. And uh, to be part of the series, I graduated and I left here in 1969. Um, and I stepped into a world I was hardly prepared for. It was a moment in which the world was in upheaval, a civil rights movement was in action, and I thought that I would try tonight to give you an overview of how I came to be where I am and what happened in those intervening years. I've come to believe that I'm a political landscape painter. I'll try to describe what I think that means. I've always known the value of art as a tool for transformation, both personal and political. What I've had to learn, though, through being attentive to, uh, attentive to my own curiosities and artistic focus, is that I choose often to use the land as my method of recording memories and stories in my paintings, murals, and monuments. I've learned to listen to the land, 
to hear the story hidden there. It is this concept that the land has memory, and that learning to put your ear to the ground, to listen and to understand the spirit of place that has been the basis of my public art making for these last 40 years. This sometimes tends to have political implications as the land is the very site of contentiousness and struggles and often becomes defined by territories and borders and walls. In all cases, the land is a site of public memory. It is from this idea that memory is somehow embedded in place which reaches across so many cultures that I derive this mountain as a conception model of an excavation of memory in a public artwork. It's a reminder that history does not begin when you arrive. We as humans feel the need to stand where important historical events happen to understand the event, to feel the story. It is common across many cultures, and in our city of nations, Los Angeles, we see it evident daily as we pass through the shifting languages and cultural markers of our city. This interest in the land's memory and for telling the stories of the people took me to contested gang territories of East Los Angeles. It was in the Vatteros of Los Angeles that I became known as the Mural Lady. I didn't really mind that title. I wanted to be a mural person, but I wasn't so sure I wanted to be a lady. <laughs> Negotiating between warring neighborhoods, I formed my first teams in a city with 129 different languages. This is the earliest picture of me on a scaffolding, looking something like Joan Baez in about 1970. <laughs> it took me to the agricultural fields of California where Mexican immigrants labored, to the urban gridlock of Los Angeles freeways where I painted for the 1984 Olympics, and around the globe, more recently to El Salvador, to work on reconciliation in a divided post-war country. There I worked with over a hundred artists to produce the first works on domestic violence against women and the rights of children to go to school rather than to labor full time in the coffee fields. It is how the river became my teacher and a classroom in which to teach and how I came to spend half of, the, of my life in a concreted river bottom just a few miles from here. Actually, most of my teaching and learning has not been in classrooms, nor has it been called education, but instead art and community transformation. The story of Los Angeles, where I was born, like many great cities, begins on the banks of the river. The Tongva people, meaning of which is the people of the earth, accommodated the rising and receding waters for centuries. But as the city grew <clears throat> in the late 20s, after a particularly bad period of flooding, it was determined by our city fathers that the river had to be tamed. The river had overflowed its allotted space and destroyed valuable real estate, by then Los Angeles' most valuable commodity. The first settlement was called Sonora Town, named for the people who came from Sonora, Mexico. And note the doorways rather high on those buildings because of the uh, accommodation of the advancing waters. As a child, I watched the, as the rivers, the arteries of the land, were turned to concrete. I think I can trace the beginnings of my career as a political landscape painter to growing up alongside of the Los Angeles River and watching its transition. Standing at the river's edge on that first day with the Army Corps of Engineers, dreaming of what it could become, I saw the concreted arroyos as scars in the land. The 40-year-long concreting project was complete, making it the largest public works project in America. Its completion gave rise to the new aesthetic recovery division at the Army Corps of Engineers, though it only lasted about a minute. Its purpose was to deal with the effects of the concrete of the royals. They were eyesores. They left dirt belts along the river and divided communities. The flood control channel, of course, had many other serious consequences to the land. The concrete river carried, carried runoff water swiftly to the ocean. 
bearing pollution from our city streets, affecting the Santa Monica Bay and depriving the aquifer of water replenishment through normal ground seepage. In a sense, the concreting of the river represented the hardening of the arteries of the land. It created dis-ease in the land. What I saw then was the metaphor, was this metaphor. The hundreds of miles of concrete conduits were scars in the land. They recall the scars I had seen on a young man's body in Los Angeles water. Fernando, my friend, and mentee had suffered multiple stab wounds in, in East Los Angeles gang warfare. I asked him once how he was feeling after the attack. My wounds are healing, he said, but every time I lift my shirt, my body is a map of violence. <clears throat> so together, we began to design transformative tattoos in an effort to make the ugly marks into something powerful and beautiful. Over the years, Fernando liked to brag that he was my greatest artwork. <laughs> that day overlooking the channel, I dreamed of a tattoo on the scar where the river once ran. As a metaphor for healing our city's divisions of race and, and class, and proposed the Great Wall of Los Angeles. I dared not speak aloud the thought that generally is accepted today, the concreting of the river was an act of violence against the earth, and healing was needed for both the river and the people. Here we are, 1976, in our first meetings. <clears throat> for 12 years, 400 young people worked on the recovery of their histories, practicing the connection to each other across class and gender differences. We developed the bike trails and the, um, the greening of the park <clears throat> did segment by segment, team after team came. We worked to tap to the scar where the river once ran in the San Fernando Valley with images that would remember our dismembered history, black, Latino, Asian, Native American. Lifelong connections were made between us all. I was a participant as well as an initiator. The vehicle for this was art. The result, still growing, half mile of mural. It was apparent to me then, as it is today, that this decision to concrete the Los Angeles River would affect the people of the city for generations to come, in subsequent planning and development decisions, and a spirit spiritual discord associated with the land. A relationship exists between the disappearance of the river and the people. If you can disappear a river, how much easier is it to disappear the history of a people? We painted 2,740 feet of mural, a half mile of imagery in the river. A visual uh, description of the moment here of the people going to Man Manzanar uh, in a 350 foot segment painted over a nine week period with about 50 young people. This is inspired by Amy Ishii's book, Camp Notes, as she came to speak to the kids. We excavated our own family stories to recover history left out of history books. Hundreds of artists, scholars, members of the public contributed time, knowledge, and their own memories for the making of the Long Wall. Chavez Ravine and the destruction of the original Sonora town in the oldest Mexican community of Los Angeles here, depicted in this image of uh, a spaceship entering uh, uh, Chavez Ravine. Today, the original children of the Great Wall are grown, and they are returning as alumni to work with another generation of Great Wall youth. I'm proud to announce that the Great Wall has been declared a site of public memory worth preservation by the state of California's Cultural and Historical Endowment, who awarded it a $2.1 million uh, grant to preserve the historic sections now over 34, 37 years old. In 2011, I led a 30-member crew to fully restore the half mile, and now we are beginning the building of the interpretive green bridge at this site. And so today, when you visit the Great Wall, you'll see it in full color, as it was intended to and as originally painted. What is important?
important also is to restore the story of those who participated in the making of the wall. This is Ernestine Jimenez. She was one of the 400 youth who came to work at the Great Wall from a juvenile detention home. In this photograph, she's 14 years old. I was directed by the director of the detention home to forget Ernestine. She was not a good hire. She had difficulties working cross-racially. Her brother was killed in interracial warfare. She was not cooperative. She would not be a good person uh, to join our crew at the Great Wall. She's pregnant here. She's a gang member. She's one of 16 children. And I couldn't walk out without taking Ernestine with me. This is her two years later at 16, with her son born, who is now a mascot on the Great Wall. This is her at 18 as a supervisor on the Great Wall. And this is her at 44, speaking about the Great Wall experience. I'd like you to hear it in her own words. The way I grew up is, you know, you fight through life. You know, I've got 10 brothers and six sisters, and I'm the baby. And it was a fight in my house all the time. And that's the way I believed you were supposed to have grown up to fight through life. Don't like nobody but your own race. And even sometimes don't even like your own race. There was a lot of tension. Um, I think everybody wanted to fight everybody, just the way they looked, or the way they looked at them, or the way they dressed. And after time, you just started get, getting to know that person as an individual instead of knowing them as you were taught to, you know. And everybody became very good friends. So it took a lot, a lot of growing up. I'm not saying that first year did it, because it didn't. It took a lot of growing up. But I made a lot of friends through the four years, and every year I understood something else. Every year. I wouldn't have went back to high school because. I wouldn't have had a role model to push me to go there. Education was Judy's number one thing. As long as I stood in school, you can come back and paint the mural. And that's what, even though I got in trouble in school and fought and everything, that was my number one goal. I wanted to come back. I had to come back. What really kind of freaked me out, though, is when I met the people that, when we painted the mural of the Holocaust, and I met the people that had the tattoos on them, that kind of blew my mind. That Actually, that made me cry. Because I know there was another world that was harder than mine. And I just really felt for it. This mural opened my eyes so much. Even when I'm down and out, I still walk by here. And I thank God I did accomplish something in life. And it makes me feel good. And I think if it wasn't for this mural, for me to have my name on it and to have accomplished something, I don't know where I'd be. Ernie's on our uh, alumni crew, uh, spoke at our dedication, and is helping us um, with the next segments of, of the Great Wall. Um, before we move forward, I, I'd like to acknowledge someone in the audience who's here, Irene Cervantes. Can you wave to her? Thank you. Those who led our crews, she worked with me on the Great Wall. And what summer was that? I think it was 1979. 1979. Woo! We were younger. <laughs> well, 400 kids, one wall. 1976 through 2011, and new segments to be added. This is uh, us beginning the restoration uh, in the summer of uh, 2011. Uh, I am painting over segments I painted 23 years earlier. 
watching my hand and trying to remember what I did, and being surprised at what the young girl knew when she was doing those first segments. We're parachuting uh, to try and uh, mitigate the heat. As you all know, the valley, it is murderous, uh, particularly in the sun and in the concrete channel. We reached a record uh, 110 one day. Um, we used sprinklers to keep ourselves uh, wet the entire time so that we could continue to paint. And we managed to do the entire segment in a four month period. So this is a, a work, uh, a segment from the 1976 part in um, a disarray. Uh, we scraped off all the loose paint. That is it today. This is a segment of the immigrants working in the fields of California. Um, this is what it looked like when it began. I was uh, painted by Isabel Castro initially, and there it is, completely restored. Here's a segment of, um, on McCarthyism. Um, the portrait done by, uh, was, was drawn by uh, Matt Worker, who worked with me, and who's just won a Pulitzer Prize with his cartooning. And um, this is what it looked like before. And the blacklist, of course, uh, and the red scare, uh, completely restored. You can see the figures falling into the um, trash can made by HUAC, the House on American Activities, and uh, the figures becoming real people. And even the pink typewriter, the typewriter is even a communist. And here we are on Chavez Ravine. Um, you can see the uh, work in, in disrepair. Uh, this is where Dodger Stadium came into the oldest Mexican community in Los Angeles. Here it is completely restored. This is a segment uh, looking down 2,400 feet of the mural. That's not the entire mural. Uh, from one scale to down to pinpoint uh, of the totally restored work. The bridge we are building um, is, um, there's a rendition of this bridge here, uh, made of cementitious material. And the connection for the first time will be made between the river and the, and the images in the Great Wall. So it is not just about social justice, but it is also about environmental justice. And so we are chronicling the history of the river, beginning with the lower segments of tin cans, ending with water bottles in the top, um, integration of uh, uh, debris from the river, which is um, some of it ground and put into the concrete, and other parts of it um, actually we're using the shopping carts as uh, railing systems. Um, we're using um, a kind of sediment to give you an idea of the history of what has happened along the river. You will be able to go across the river, look down into the water, and see it in various conditions, um, and begin to understand the relationship between the people and the river. Also, we'll reclaim that space for night walking. It'll be a place where you'll be able to come, uh, and the San Fernando Valley Museum, will, um, the director of whom's in the audience, will help lead us tours uh, so that people will be able to walk along this site. And uh, it will be lit with lights so that the Great Wall will be viewing, able to be viewed night and day. The Great Wall led to many other pieces. And it also um, provided a methodology that I applied in multiple sites. And I'd like to talk about the first time that I told my own family story, having told stories of many people I had never told my own or my own family story. And the Denver International piece, La Memoria de Nuestra Tierra, uh, The Memory of Our Land, is a piece that uh, begins with my grandmother and is now permanently installed in the Denver International. So if you're waiting in um, security line, you'll be standing in front of my grandfather and you'll be standing in front of the history of Latinos or uh, the Mexicano in the largest migration that occurred in the United States for, for the Mexican immigrants. And I'm certain that my memory, that my, my notion that the land has memory came from Francisca, my grandmother. This is her. She raised me. In her world, everything had its place. If something was taken from the land, something was returned. She asked plants for permission before uh, she cut them and put them into a tin can and made them grow green when they were dried twigs. Everything had meaning. 
And in her world, um, she turned the, the weeds that grew by the water fountain into potions and into healing herbs. My grandparents came from Mexico to La Junta, Colorado, during the Mexican Revolution. They followed the course traveled by thousands of other Mexican families from Chihuahua to the United States um, through the historic northern territories of Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, via the Ellis Island of the Southwest, El Paso. This is the peace and full installation of the airport. My mother was born in La Junta, the junction, educated in the Colorado segregated school system, and raised in its segregated housing in the 1920s and 30s. The simple fact that even in death, the bodies of racially different people were required to remain separate was what moved me to create an artwork that would give dignity to the mestizo story and the stories of countless others who toiled in the mines, fields, and railroads of Colorado. This is Corky Gonzalez and Cesar Chavez bringing the great work up to Colorado, a photograph we found in someone's garage. Um, a Cheyenne woman from the Cheyenne Massacre that occurred on the corner of the Luisa Maria Vaca land grant. And a photograph found in the museum, the railroad museum, with my grandmother, grandfather facing out in, his, uh, in the wrong attire uh, as he becomes a railroad worker um, and becomes the central image of this uh, piece. These are my grandparents making that crossing as if they're walking on water, a miraculous journey. The purpose of the work was not only to tell the forgotten stories of people who, like birds or water, traveled back and forth across the land freely before there was a line that distinguished which side you were from, but to speak to our shared human condition as temporary residents of the earth. This is my grandfather. Uh, it is a story that has been little, a little chronicled, and one for which I was anxious to create a visual record. It is the first work in which I'm incorporating both digital imagery and hand-painted uh, imagery simultaneously in a single image. <clears throat> this is the Ludlow mining strike, um, which is um, depicted here both with photographic imagery and painted surfaces. Corky and Cesar Chavez, as they become mesas, they become mountains in the history of this region. And through the process, we were able to do a reconciliation of the Mexican graves in this little town that allowed them to go fallow. And my family has gathered here with the Familia Vaca headstone uh, recovering the graves, graves of my, grand, my mother's sisters, my mother's uh, uncles, um, and our family moves from left from a Navajo, my Aunt Marie, who's Navajo, all the way to my cousins on the right, um, and the mixture of the Mestizo uh, family of the Bacas. The process of the Great Wall moved into Los Angeles, into the Central American community. There, in a place called the Central American Research and Education Center. I worked again with a group of people to use the same process, the creation of timelines, the creations of collection of family story, and these are a group of young people who are talking to their parents who left Central America during the war in El Salvador and began to collect their family stories to create a new image that would become a kind of Mayan map in um, the Pico Union region of Los Angeles where the largest diaspora of Central Americans exists. As they collected the photographs and images from their family, some of these were incredibly difficult images. They were images of people, people's loss. And the question was, how do we use these images? How could we create a story? This is a, a mother and child um, in the um, rosary. These are people, these are photographs taken and often these photographs were the last photographs of members of the family that they had. Uh, these are people who will be disappeared and will never be seen again. <clears throat> 75,000 people were killed in El Salvador during this war. And, um, of course, uh, the people who came to Los Angeles live in a, a concentrated region in Pico Union. Um, these are people who were disappeared from uh, the on the left are the images of those who have been disappeared. On the right is an image that made it into the mural. Both these images ended up in the mural 
um, is a, is a, a, a drawing from a woman who survived the Al Masota massacre. Um, the, the photos of the disappeared on the left. Uh, telling the story, we were directed by scholars and survivors who found and found ourselves negotiating between the children of the parents who fled. Uh, a generational conflict arose as the young people argued against the difficult imagery in their mural, and many parents shared their story with their children for the first time, reluctant, in, uh, as in the past, to, to speak of the events that unfolded during that time, very much uh, uh, like the Holocaust. The final image was agreed on, and that image with the 26 young people who worked with me uh, over um, uh, practically a year in negotiations going back and forth uh, was a resilient young woman standing in front of the paramilitary with Oscar Romero, the Bishop Romero, uh, in, the, in the background, and the, the migration of golden people leaving their country coming to Pico Union. This is the final image. It's um, 10, it's, it's actually 15 feet by 37 feet installed permanently in the central um, area of uh, Gunnison's um, auditorium. It's a kind of Mayan map, and if you go to this place um, uh, in Pico Union, you'll be led on a tour by a young person who will tell you the story of how people came to migrate to Los Angeles. And they are waiting to do the next segment, which be which will be called the Mayans in LA. Throughout this process, I've been working on a single piece that is a what I like to say is a segment of the Great Wall that gets up and moves around the world. And this is a segment that is um, a 360 foot long linear work that travels in, uh, um, we call it the Scud missile. Um, it travels from site to site. Here it is in Gorky Park. And to each country to which it travels, another work is added. This is actually in an installation in 1990 at the time of the fall of the Communist Party. There will be 150,000 people who will come to see this work. And the Russian work will be added. This is called Triumph of the Hands. And it's about looking at your capacity as laborers to change what you do and to break the machine, the kind of treadmill chasing the dollar and begin to think about the fact that you can do something more with yourselves and with your work and with your art. And this is a work contributed by um, a Cossack artist named Alexei Begov, who um, painted this work called Waiting for the End of the 20th Century. And his, it's exactly that moment uh, in which I think he pretty much nailed what was happening in that, at that point. I kept saying to him, can you see beyond the man with the cane? And he kept saying to me through our translators, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not yet. And you'll see the craning necks, the man with the blind man leading them to the future, the crucified uh, Soviet people on the left, and also <laughs> all the people who are jumbled below are making the sign of the cross as the churches are being opened. Um, the central figure, the little child, is the one that picks up the color of balance in my image, which is the peace image. Um, uh, which is the hopeful vision, the future uh, that Alexei has, has painted. You see, these are 10 feet by 30 foot pieces each. Um, this is Alexei Begov addressing <coughs> 150,000 people who came to this opening. Um, it took eight people to carry the flowers that were given to our team uh, because people were so grateful to see this work that was looking for cooperation worldwide. The work traveled from there uh, from Finland to the Soviet Union to the Smithsonian and then back to East Los Angeles where my work began. Um, to a place just blocks from where you saw me with the original headband. And we discussed there what peace was, what is peace in our communities, what is global peace and what is neighborhood peace, and what is the relationship between the two. This is a piece that I painted with my team in Los Angeles. Um, each of the people are holding a piece of the answer, a piece of the light. Uh, a young African-American boy walks out into the space reflecting the shadow of Gandhi, the winds of war on the horizon. <clears throat> Balance is a piece that came, came about from our discussions with the Hopis. We said, if, what is peace anyway, said one of my team members. Is it everybody sitting around watching TV? Um, 
And then we realized that we didn't have any image for it. We didn't really know what that looked like. Couldn't figure it out. And so I invited the Hopis. And the Hopi elders came and they said, Judy, this is easy. I said, please tell me, because I, I can't see it. He said, it's about an ever active moment of the creation of balance. The balance of the sun and the moon, of the earth and, the, uh, um, and human beings. So this is a birthing image, it's an image of birthing. And it's an image of, of the balance of male and female. He said, the world has gotten too male. I say this out to all the young women here. The world has become too male. It's time for the grandmothers to teach. So we moved on. And the um, next place was the Israeli and Palestinian, Palestinian collaboration. We began with um, um, artists working in their home communities. And who you're looking at here is Suleiman Monsour on the left, who is a Palestinian artist, who up until this point is only painted in the Palestinian colors of the flag. Um, the man in the center is uh, um, Ahmed Bariat, who is um, a Arab and Israeli. And Adi Yucatilili on the right is a um, Israeli artist. They've agreed to work in their home communities and bring back the imagery to create one single image. And this is that image um, that is created from images they selected from their um, uh, sketchbooks. Um, the figure on the left in white with a, with a broom is um, Suleiman Mansour's family with their original uh, olive fields and his father now not having land and becoming a, a domestic worker. Um, the bridge figure is uh, Ahmed Bariat, uh, a very kind of like a Chicano image, um, multiple character image. And on the right is um, the angel figure um, in struggle with himself. The, the Golan figure is the mud figure coming together or falling apart. And all the images behind it are children's ideas about peace. And of course you see conflict repeatedly in those images. You see upside down forests, you see black balloons, you see a kind of um, struggle for them to even begin to think about peace. That work was at, um, dedicated, oh, I, might, I have to say that at the time we began, they couldn't finish the painting because they, the war began. So we had to bring all of them out uh, to Monterey and to the tank buildings that we had converted into mural studios at California State University in Monterey Bay. And so I sent them an email and I said, uh, they said, we can't work, Judy. We have the drawings, but we can't meet. I said, uh, would you, could you come to California? And they said, yes, we think so. I said, okay, and I waited and I did some more work trying to figure out how to bring him here. And then I went back and I said, could you live in one house? I only have one house. <laughs> and they said, we think so. Um, and I said, uh, could you finish it in three weeks? <laughs> and they said, yes. And uh, we uh, uh, produced this work with the help of students from California State University in Monterey Bay. Today, we're working on a new piece. This is a Canadian piece. The working title of it is called The Inuit Sent the World a Canary. And it has to do with the notion of global warming and Canada's culture of extraction. It was a photograph I took over um, the Queen Charlotte's from a seaplane in which you're looking at a clear cut in the middle of wilderness. And the clear cut is turned into an open wound. I didn't Photoshop it. It became the way the light fell onto the space. And I completely was sort of amazed by it. And I thought, this is really an important image to talk about what we're going to do next. Uh, this is a work by a Canadian artist uh, and her team out of British Columbia. And uh, they will become the ninth mural in the World Wall series. And it's in progress right now. Uh, in a uh, barn uh, uh, on an island off the coast of British Columbia. We're waiting for the freeze to end so they can continue painting. Uh -huh. And um, uh, the notion is it was inspired by uh, Sheila Watt Cloutier, who brought the international uh, attention to the spectrum of global warming changes um, a few years ago, talking about how things were changing in the Arctic. This is the uh, barn uh, that we've done the installation in. And um, uh, Tanya uh, Gajorogia uh, Pierce, who is 
um, leading this uh, work. And it talks about essentially the salmon and their basic importance in, in the history of the culture of the, of the Canadians and how the salmon actually even um, are responsible for the growth of the forests um, and the interrelatedness between um, the natural environment and the people. And uh, this is the very first woman, Elizabeth May, who was elected as a Green Party person who has come to the studio to see the work. And uh, here we are as uh, Tanya begins her painting. And I am um, helping instruct her on how to deal with the, the tar pit mines uh, and the um, mouth that is created by uh, um, the strip mining that uh, is being proposed. And while we are doing this, we are stopping them from destroying a lake. The lake is called um, Fish Lake, and it's the seed of a culture um, that is a, that the whole history of, that, uh, of these uh, indigenous people are based on that lake. And uh, the environmentalists are working with us, and we are using the internet and social media to call attention to the production and also the attention of current issues. Um, this piece will be dedicated shortly, and um, we hope will be done within the next months. <clears throat> This is um, a whole other approach, but very much informed by the Great Wall. This is a piece that's based on a Mayan cor coral arch, one of my most recent works. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a piece that is on San Jose State uh, State's, um, campus in the Paseo de Cesar Chavez. And uh, it is a 25-foot arch. Um, and it reflects both the Spanish and indigenous roots of, of uh, Cesar Chavez. But it's a, it's a triumphant arch, but you'll notice that it is not a bronze statue to, to Cesar Chavez. It is not an ennobled man. It is instead um, the, the people on the outside of the arch are depict, that are depicted are the farm workers and those who bolstered the movement. Uh, in the interior is Chavez, and above him is a, um, a three-ton stacked glass eagle uh, from the United Farm Workers. Um, we are trying to create the sensibility of reflective light within the architecture. Um, it's, of course, the eagle is an upside down pyramid, and it is a reflection of the UFW flag. And as you pass through this, you move from being a worker, a student, a worker, and a, a, to the other side to become an activist. And on the opposite side, you see Dolores Huerta and Magandi, um, because uh, we're looking at them as the major inspirations for the development of the United Farm Workers. And uh, Chavez is metaphorically standing among the twisted vines of the grapes uh, in, in California. These are the portraits that have been turned into Byzantine glass. Each of these pieces over 200,000 pieces. So while we are looking at visual imaging and new technologies, we're also preserving the historic techniques. This is, a, of course, the inspiration for Chavez's nonviolent actions and his spiritual practice that is so critical to, to um, the farm workers' movement. This is Dolores standing in front of the Chavez final image. Um, and a very important moment for me, this is the 200,000 pieces uh, of glass that makes up one of these pieces, and you can really see why people gave this up. <laughs> <laughs> I have little patience for gluing glass, but uh, what an amazing experience. Um, but my most important moment was this moment, in which I got to show the piece to, uh, to Dolores. And she said to me, she whispered to me, she said, how long will it last? And I said, Dolores, forever. She was just like, come with me. Really? So here is Dolores with herself as an 18-year-old. None was harder. Perhaps one of the most important sites uh, that I've had to address and one of the most difficult is a site in which uh, Robert Kennedy was murdered. He came to the Ambassador Hotel in June of 1968, having won the uh, primary. Um, 
This is actually the kind of posters that I helped hand out when I was a young girl uh, in support of Robert Kennedy. This is the kind of thing that happened all over California as he ran for office. People reaching for him. He was the hope. Um, he was the hope for leadership in America. And some say that things changed forever after he was lost and that we never believed again in leadership in the same way. And uh, here you can see the ambassador in its uh, historic beauty uh, as a postcard. Uh, this is the famous kitchen in which Kennedy was murdered, uh, where Sirhan uh, shot him as he moved off the podium, having given his speech, and stepped into this corridor. It is exactly on this footprint that the new um, Robert F. Kennedy Center Learning Center has been built. And I was commissioned to do the embassy ballroom where he gave his last words. And the embassy ballroom includes the site where he was murdered. This is um, <clears throat> Julio Romero, who's holding him as he uh, is dying. And here we are in the embassy ballroom with a piece that will be done, the first of my works, uh, that is entirely painted on screen produced in the largest digital print um, ever made as a single image in the highest resolution ever made. So this piece is one uh, print, and it is painted, but not with brushes on, on a canvas. It's painted on screen. Um, this will become the Paul Schrade Library. The Paul Schrade is the man who was shot with Kennedy. He was shot first in the head and fell in front of Kennedy. In fact, Kennedy's last words were, is Paul okay, where is Paul? So here we are as the pieces are going up, and the large hands are hands of real people, um, people that support uh, the notions of, of uh, Kennedy's values, um, particularly the values he had as the, in the last part of his life as he transformed um, to become president after his brother's death. <clears throat> you can see um, me preparing for gold leafing. We're going to use gold leaf in the historic methods of gold leaf application. And uh, this is the paint portrait I painted of him on screen. Um, it says, uh, it, what, one of the things that people say is that we are still recovering uh, from these uh, deaths of, the, of, of leaders, particularly Robert Kennedy. At the end of his life, he was reading Siddhartha, uh, and this piece is based on his last speech, or one of his early uh, speeches in, um, uh, during the apartheid in South Africa. <clears throat> it's called Tiny Ripples of Hope. <clears throat> and he said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all these acts will be written the history of this generation. Each time a person stands for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these rippers build a current that can sweep down the mightiest of walls of oppression and resistance. So that was my charge. What did that look like? What do those tiny ripples of hope look like? These are all people that are poets, that are writers, that are activists, um, who I photographed and then painted. Here's the final image in the Paul Schrade Library. Um, and across from it is a piece, if, if this first piece is about hope, this second piece is about compassion. And what is the antidote to sociopathic youth? Hope and compassion. Kennedy said, I come from tons and tons of gold from questionable sources. And after his brother's death, he begins a quest to become an enlightened leader. At the time of his death at the, at the Ambassador Hotel, he is rethinking all of his leadership characteristics. He's gone to talk to people everywhere. Here he is in Appalachia. He's gone to the Indian reservations. He's gone um, to Mississippi. And he begins to forge ahead with a different notion uh, about leadership. He goes to visit Cesar Chavez on the 25th day of his fast, and he helps break Chavez's fast by breaking bread with him. 
And um, the image here is a lotus blossom. It determines the composition. We are on the edge of Chinatown, of a Korea town um, at this site. So both formally and conceptually, it's a lotus. The lotus carries these different ideas. And he, in his speech, uh, one of his speeches, he says, the most important issues, and he's talking to my generation, he says, that you will have to face are war, healthcare, poverty, intolerance, or inequity, and education, and the environment. He's speaking to these students at this time, and of course he could be speaking to us now. Here's war. On the left, the young boy facing the decision about whether he will fight in Afghanistan or whether he become a soldier. Uh, healthcare uh, is depicted by my mother and my aunt who are um, visiting with uh, Lourdes Royball, who is their madrina, who's 101 years old. So it's from the fetus to the aging. Here they're breaking the bread. <clears throat> and behind them is Dolores Huerta um, leading, as an 18-year-old, the um, uh, Primero de Mayo events in Los Angeles where millions of people marched uh, for the rights of immigrants. And um, you can see uh, the, the grapes in the background. This is um, education, and it's bad education. It's education which this young girl is crossing her fingers saying, I hope I can make it through this. And there are um, metal detectors in crowded schools. And uh, she is uh, facing these things. And it says, um, safe schools, please. Education is a right, not a privilege. On the right is the beautiful rainforest of the Northwest and the melting of the, of the uh, polar ice caps. I'm going to conclude with this piece. And perhaps um, it's one of my more recent pieces. And this piece is just about the joy of life. It's called Danza de la Tierra, which is about dance. I think if, the, if you think about living, the opposite of dying is dancing. So uh, it's paid, it was produced for the uh, Latino Fine Arts Museum in Dallas, Texas, in the Legoreta uh, building. And um, when I started to think about doing this work at this site, um, I wrote a piece about the correlation between muralism and dance. A mural is not an easel painting made large. A mural is a work of art created in relatedness relatedness to the architecture in which it is placed, to the people for whom it is painted. It is related to those who lift the brushes to help paint it. A mural comp mural's compositional lines draw the body of the unsuspecting passerby into the painting by the solar plexus, yanking at their heart. At their best, muralists pass brushes between hands and precise poetic marks without individual distinction. Where one hand ends, another begins. It is a choreographed dance between team members, community residents, and street life. A mural scale transforms place and merges the viewer uh, in color, amplifies community voice. A mural sings gospel from our streets and preaches to us about who we can be, what we fear, and to what we can aspire. At their highest moments, murals can reveal to us what is hidden, challenge the prevailing dialogues, transform people's lives, exercise our most important rights of free speech, and indeed be the catalyst for change in difficult times. Thank you.